Excellencies, leaders of global tourism, good morning to everyone who's come here today. It's great to see people standing up at the back, so a great audience. My name is Max Foster from CNN International. Honoured to be moderating today's UNWTO WTM Ministerial Summit in 2017, which is, of course, United Nations International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. Uh, CNN is a very proud partner with the UNWTO and working with the global tourism community over the years to grow the global tourism sector for the better of travellers, destinations, businesses, locals, the environment, and the global community at large. And everyone there is represented here today. To officially open our session today, though, please welcome Simon Press, the Senior Exhibitions Director of Reed Exhibitions. Yeah, I almost had to ab-lib all the way through that. <coughs> Secretary General Taleb, Refai, Ministers, distinguished guests and colleagues, a very warm welcome to WTM London's 11th Minister's Summit in association with the United Nations World Tourism Organization. This event is unique in that it brings together both the public and private sectors in an open forum to, to discuss the key challenges facing our industry. Such an approach is, I believe, absolutely fundamental to deliver real change within the industry. And today's topic, over tourism. Growth is not the enemy, it is how we manage it, has been at the top of the news agenda all year. The global travel industry continues to grow. The first six months of this, year's, of this year saw the greatest growth since 2010, with a 6% increase on the same period in 2016. 598 million trips were made, 36 million more than in the first six months of last year. This year will be the, the sixth year in a row that we will see more than 1 billion trips. The overall picture for the industry is positive. However, this year the term over-tourism has entered the global vocabulary. Many destinations are struggling with balancing the needs and rights of both local residents and tourists as the growth of no-frills carriers and more peer-to-peer -peer sector have seen tourism explode. Barcelona is a city that has hit the headlines the greatest, maybe, with a group of its 1.6 million residents speaking out against the impact the city's 32 million visitors are having on their lives. Rents rose by 16.5% in 2016, as landlords focus on attracting tourists to their properties. The numbers of tourists to the city has grown by 25% in four years, from 27 million. Barcelona is not alone. Santorini is limiting the number of cruise visitors to 8,000 a day. Venice residents have asked for the banning of cruise ships as cruise visitors have grown by the factor of five in the past 15 years. Furthermore, popular attractions including Machu Picchu and Mount Everest are capping the numbers of visitors accompanied by recognized guides. And Zion National Park is looking at proposals to limit visitors through a reservation system. The tourism industry is yet to come to grips with the issues and, unfortunately, there is a tendency to downplay the issues, but not here at WTM London. 2017 is the United Nations International Year of Sustainable Tourism, but how sustainable is tourism if this issue is not addressed? Tourism is a central pillar to many local and national economies, but over-tourism is changing the perception of the benefits of mass tourism. Today's panel is perfectly placed to debate this most important of topics. Both the private and public sector are able to provide unique insights and vast experience in tackling such issues from all perspectives. I am delighted to see such a packed room in front of me, including obviously a high number of ministers. This demonstrates to me both the importance of this summit and today's topic. WTM London will facilitate approaching three billion pounds worth in industry travel and tourism deals from almost one million 
meetings held during the three days of the event. While the summit is the largest gathering of tourism ministers outside of the UNWTO's own General Assembly, a fact that we are very proud of. Before, I'd like to, before I finish, I would like to highlight a new event uh, that we're uh, opening this afternoon. The Minister's Destination Investment Symposium bringing ministers and investors together for a unique invite-only event. All ministers are obviously welcome to the event at 2.30 in the Platinum Suite 3, which will look at how successful investment has led to sustainable economic success. I would like to draw your attention to the new WTM awards as well that will be launched at next year's event. These awards will celebrate excellence in destination marketing above all things, and I hope to see many of your countries enter the awards and in attendance at the event, which will be taking place next year on the Tuesday, the 6th of November. Enough of the plugs. It's now my pleasure to invite, you, uh, to, invite to the platform my great friend, Mr. Talib Rifai, Secretary General of the UNWTO. During Talib's reign, he has overseen a shift in mindset. During Talib's reign, he has seen a shift in mindset for travel and tourism. The industry is now at the heart of governments all over the world. While the industry has moved from thinking about what it can do for itself to how it can help the world. Personally, I'd like to thank Talib and his contribution for all, from all at World Travel Market and Re Travel Exhibitions. And I'd like to give a small gift of our appreciation. Hopefully it will remind you of a, a few good memories from the UNWTO and WTM Ministerial Summits at London. I won't, <coughs> I won't ask you to obviously carry it home, so we will um, uh, put it um, and freight it to you. I don't know whether you want to open it now or later. It's entirely up to you, Talib. <laughs> Let's rip it. Let's rip it, okay. Wow, wow. Oh, it's beautiful. So I'd just like to thank again Talib Rifai. Many thanks for your help and assistance and support. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just keep it. Yeah, certainly. Thank you so much, Simon. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, everybody, for being with us this lovely, lovely London morning. Even the weather was kind with us. Must have very good connections here at WTM. Carrying this is going to be a little bit challenging. I have trained myself to travel with only carry-ons. So that's going to be quite a challenge, Simon, but I'm sure I can count on you. My dear Simon, it's been a pleasure to work with you on WTM. I still remember a few days ago when we started this idea. We were struggling to get people into the room. Today, you can see how successful this has been. And it's been successful because of all of you, because of your encouragement, because of your interaction, because of your enthusiasm. Let me thank each and every one of you, all the good friends. It took me half an hour, it took me two hours to get from my hotel to here, but it took me half an hour to get from that door to this podium, which shows you how many friends one can acquire in a crowd like this. Thank you all very, very much. In the script, it says, Excellencies, dear friends. I only see friends. So, dear friends. Charles Darwin once said, It is not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage change. Today, the world is a major transformation junction. Rapid and fast change is the essence of our time without doubt. Three global forces are leading this transformation. I'd like to call them three revolutions. 
the changing the world as we know it, shaping our future and connecting us in unprecedented ways, connecting our lives, our minds, our hearts, and our destinies. One is the IT digital revolution, connecting our minds virtually and globally. Two is the urban revolution, connecting our lifestyles, our livelihood, and the way we think and connect to each other. But thirdly is the travel revolution, which is connecting us physically and bonding us in unprecedented ways. Travel and tourism, my friends, I want to suggest, has become today a global force and a cornerstone in major transformations. Travel and tourism also has become today an integral part of major resulting global challenges that the world in general is confronting. We at UNWTO, with your good help, because it's your organization, identified three major challenges that are controlling and governing the world of today. One, safety and security. Two, IT digital technology disruptions. And three, the long-lasting challenge that will stay with us for generations to come, sustainability. These challenges come together with other symptoms that have become so familiar to many of us in the world of today. Climate change, migration, unemployment, poverty, and the list can go on and on. Yet, despite these challenges, and against all odds, travel and tourism distinguishes itself from many other economic sectors and human activities and continues to grow in a remarkably impressive way. As you all know, Last year's international tourism registered the seventh consecutive year of above average economic growth in a row. This year, 2017, is no different. Growth is set to continue at an estimated 4.5 to 5 percent, although our official records would say 3.5 to 4 percent. They are very conservative, but I don't even try to change it. In 2016, there was 1,235 million international travelers that cross international borders in one single year. That's almost one out of six of the people of the world making an international trip every year. UNWTO long-term forecast shows that this 1.2 billion today is going to become 1.8 billion by 2030. Travel has become today a way of life, part of our culture. There is no stopping to it. And it's important to start by stating that ahead of what your discussions today is going to be all about. It's not anymore just a human need or an elitist urge. It has become today very much of a human right. You have heard me say this many times, but I want to emphasize it. It is a human right. Nobody has to stop, had the right to stop anybody from going anywhere to enjoy this world that we inherited from our ancestors. Our right to enjoy the world, our right to relax, our right to do business, our right to hear, seek health care, our right to seek education, are rights that are equal to any other human rights of the day. Equal to my right for a job, my right for a home, my right for health care. I'm therefore confident that in many years to come, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now, the future generations are going to look back at today and say that was the age of travel. We're living it. But as you all know, my dear friends, with growth comes power, and with power comes responsibility. I always like to dramatize it by saying 1.8 billion travelers are 1.8 billion opportunities or 1.8 billion disasters. It's all up to us. How we manage this impressive, unstoppable growth is a real challenge. My dear friends, growth is not the enemy. Progress is not the enemy. If we don't progress as human beings, we will regress. And if we regress, life on earth will stop. Growth is our story. Let's not be afraid of it. Numbers are not the enemy. The key is to manage growth in a sustainable and responsible and intelligent way and to use the power of growth to our advantage. We have it at our hands. We have to use it. We have to divert it. We have to convert it into a power for good. My dear friends, over this summer, reports from all over the world had spoken about something called tourism phobia or over-tourism. They have shown us citizens protesting against the invasion of tourists. I even saw a slogan in one of the cities that are under question now that says, tourists go home, tourists are terrorists. 
many destinations, Venice, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Dubrovnik, and many, many others, communities start to look at our sector as a real threat. My dear friends, this is a wake-up call for us, reminding us of our responsibility. We've been, always been talking about uh, being, us being responsible, reminding us that responsibility and the responsible decisions have to be made, and now, immediately. Decisions that better enable destinations to provide healthy, safe environments and enrich the experience for visitors and for hosts. A destination that is not good for its citizens and its community cannot and will never be good for its visitors. A country that is not enjoyed by its people cannot and will not, should not be enjoyed by any visitor. It's a major principle. We're not here to be servants to rich people. We're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. We cannot continue to build five-star hotels in three-star communities. My dear friends, again I want to stress, growth is not the enemy. It's how we manage this growth that counts. The easy way out from overcrowding and over-tourism is to say, no more tourists. That's easy. Some politicians are riding on this wave. It is time to change the policies, businesses, practices, and all else that has connected to tourist behaviors as well. We need to understand this phenomena a bit better. Let me suggest the following. Number one, so far, and I just say so far, this phenomenon has been a developed society phenomenon. It's been taking place in mature destinations, not in developing countries or emerging destinations yet. Two, this phenomenon is connected to seasonality. It happens when there are most crowds coming at a particular time. It doesn't happen all year round. Three, it's normally a destination where there is a big impact of the cruise industry coming to a port, call of port. Port of call, I'm sorry. Four, it definitely is aggravated and it is blamed on something called the platform tourism services, which many of you may like to call the sharing economy. We have decided to call it the platform tourism services for a good reason. I hope we'll have a chance to discuss it in the circle and in the debate that will follow. In this respect, allow me to outline four essential, four essential possible responses to this that may trigger some of the thoughts in your minds and in your heads for the debate that will follow. One, growth, progress on one hand, sustainability, preservation and protection on the other hand are not a zero-sum game. Social sustainability, community benefits are the key for this. It is not enough, and I repeat, it's not enough for the tourism industry to say, I'm providing jobs to the community. It must provide livelihood to their own businesses. The dignity of the community is not only to be serving the visitors. You do that at your homes, but you do, don't, don't do that for a living. You need to create jobs that are the possession and are part of the enterprises that are owned by the community. And I have many examples. I hope we'll have a chance to discuss some of them in the minutes to come. Jobs alone are not enough. Charity is not enough. Paying back in corporate social responsibility is not enough. What is needed is to create and encourage the businesses that are created by the community to flourish and benefit from each and every tourist that comes. The community must see every tourist as a potential business opportunity. We need to create incentives and policies to reduce energy and water consumption by engaging and coordinating with the local community and to address their other needs as such. We cannot allow the tourism crowds to make life more difficult and more expensive to people. Two, we need to diversify visitors' activities, both in type and in location, and support them with policies to reduce seasonality. We can come up with the concept of vouchers, Cruises can be given vouchers on top of their ships, vouchers that would allow some of the cruisers to use restaurants, to use museums, to use facilities in return for a certain agreement and arrangement with the cruises. 
There are many, many ideas that would allow us to engage the local community and their businesses with the crowds that come. Three, incentives for private sector to invest in new areas and new products. If you just drive one kilometer outside the city center of Venice, there are beautiful hills with wonderful chapels. We should invest there. We should encourage people to go there. Nobody really goes there unless you have some ventures to go there. Same thing about Barcelona. If you travel just 400 or 500 meters outside the city center, there is very little to do. The citizens there are saying, where are the tourists? We're not benefiting enough. Just you go half a kilometer into the city center and the citizens there are saying, we don't want any more tourists. That is an unbalance that must be corrected. Three, four, I'm sorry. We must engage in raising awareness and working with the media to help address these negative public perceptions about tourism. We have to embark on an awareness campaign. We have to be conscious that things don't happen by themselves. We need to accelerate them and we need to influence them. My dear friends, in conclusion and a final thought, all of our efforts for the last decades to shape a more responsible and committed global sector should not go in vain. We're not going to let it go. You're not going to let it go. Every growing human activity has a downside to it, has a dark side to it, every human activity. The answer should never be to stop and hold this activity and to lose its clear benefits and values, but rather to live up to the challenges of managing it correctly. I may be ambitious, I may be naive, but I believe in the power of man. I believe in the power of human being. We can continue to respect the right of everybody to visit everywhere they want to and for people to be there where they want to be and at the same time, make it pleasant, make it right, make it good by managing these crowds for people and for their hosts. We can do that. We have to live up to that challenge. We don't have the other choice. Living up to this challenge of making it ever more relevant to the dreams and challenges facing our humanity. Jobs, security, migration, poverty can be addressed through much of encouraging tourism. We need to look beyond our silos and understand the global agenda. Only when we become relevant to others can we attract attention and we have the right then to ask for benefits. We cannot cry benefits, we cannot cry attention if we do not adopt others' agenda. To be relevant, you have to be relevant to others. My dear friends, James Michener said, if you reject the food, ignore the customs, fear the religion, and avoid the people, who might rather be staying at home. In this International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, my final message to you must always be to remember, travel, enjoy, and respect. Respect nature, respect culture, respect the people. I thank you all very much, and I wish you all the very best in the days to come. Thank you. As you all know, this is Dr. Rifai's last ministerial summit here in London, and I've been at a few events with him over the past year, and wherever he goes, he's heaped with gifts, and it just shows how fondly you all think of him, how the whole sector thinks of him. Uh, and I think, as this is his last London summit, it would be great if we could uh, express that sentiment with a round of applause.
microphone's not working, so maybe I should come down here a bit further. Um, Overtourism, of course, quite a new word in the lexicon of global tourism. I've got a whole list of other words that have been used in its place, tourism phobia, anti-tourism as well. Uh, whatever the words use, the sentiment really is the same, isn't it? You imagine these crowds of people, insights, ruining the experience. And on this subject, we can all speak to it because we've all had that experience. So it's a very personal subject for many of us as well. Uh, but we all know as well in this sector that um, tourism can be a force for good and it should be a force for good. And it's about balancing that. And Talib, you were speaking to that. And we're going to try and get into some examples because that's what this panel can do for us today. Uh, a very timely uh, time to have the discussion as well. The UN uh, International Year of Sustainable Tourism is coming to an end. <laughs> And as Dr. Refai says, growth is not the enemy, management is the challenge to be embraced, and you're all part of that. Uh, the realities of unmanaged growth are already being felt in some destinations, as you all know. Increased cost of living, elevated numbers of people causing challenges to mobility and just getting around. Uh, loss of identity to promote local culture and experience, pressure on natural and cultural resources as well. Importantly, how do you as a sector ensure inclusion of local communities in this experience delivery because that's obviously the big challenge going forward right uh, and everyone enjoying tourism actually and we've got a panel uh, which we've selected carefully who can speak to this and we've also got lots of other tourism ministers as well who are going to play into this sitting behind but um, if I could start with uh, Gloria Guevara she's president and CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council I'm going to go around and introduce all of you uh, we've also got His Excellency Enrique de la Madrid Secretary of Tourism for Mexico we've got Mr John Glenn Minister of Arts and Heritage and Tourism uh, for the United Kingdom uh, Mr Ryochi Matsuyama the president of the Japan National Tourism so uh, Organization rather Patrick Robson, Robinson, Head of Policy EMEA for Airbnb. Uh, we've also got Inga Hubrex, the Vice President Responsible for Business at Carlson Resort Hotel Group. Thank you very much. And on the other side of the panel, uh, we are joined uh, uh, by Mr. Talib Rifai, of course, Secretary General of the UNWTO, but also uh, His Excellency Mr. Mauricio Ventura, Minister of Tourism for Costa Rica. Uh, we've got Mrs. Elena Kuntora, Minister of Tourism for Greece. You've got a lot to say on this issue. You've had it for a long time. I'm sure. Manfredi uh, Lefebvre Dovi Dio, also chairman of Silver Seas Cruises. Uh, Mr. Mohamed Sajid, Minister of Tourism for Morocco. Uh, also, we are waiting for the uh, representative from the European Parliament, but I'm sure he'll be here as he comes along. And Kate Gibson is also Vice President of Global Corporate Responsibility for Intercontinental Hotels Group. Uh, Mr. Halid Yassim Amidvo, also chairman of the Sharjah uh, Commerce and uh, Tourism Development authority. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'm going to come to the Minister of Greece first of all, because obviously a great history of tourism and you've learnt how to deal with over-tourism. But if I could start by going round the panel and asking how you would define it as someone who's had a lot of experience of it, how would you describe over-tourism and the challenges that come with it? Well, in my view, and especially for Greece, uh, I don't think that uh, over-tourism exists. Uh, Greece is a very traditional destination for sun and sea. All these years was known for the summer season, even though that we have 365 days of wonderful weather, sun, and I would say that we are a blessed country because we are in Europe, the country that has more than 16,000 kilometers of coastline and more than 100 islands that everyone can visit. Of course, we are very known for our history and our culture, the land that uh, democracy was born, um, Olympic Games, at the same time is uh, the land of uh, <coughs> philosophy. But when you Latin, say over-tourism doesn't is, exist, we've been to those locations and um, they've got very busy. Well, they're very busy in the summer season. That's why our policy and our strategy and our goal is 365 days destination. And this is that we uh, create uh, the last three years. We work very close with uh, Talib Rifai um, and I'm very, very grateful for his advices because we um, achieved to prolong our season, which was very important for us. So to be able to satisfy all the tourists through a bigger 
uh, a longest period of uh, tourism, not only for the summer season, but also through the year. So Santorini, for example, of course is a very popular island, so we managed 2016 to stay open even winter time, more than 100 <coughs> hotels, and uh, um, the winter of 2016, 2017, they stayed open all. So it was a big, big success, and it's um, an example how you can manage well so to spread all these tourists through 365 days a year so to eliminate this kind of problem. So for me, uh, the policy to prolong the summer season and open up 365 days destination, a country that can support that, at the same time to uh, promote new destinations, new Greek destinations that they're not that popular, but they can satisfy yeah. really uh, all the tourists. At the same time, to create thematic products like religion tourism, like medical tourism, wellness, uh, convention, and of course our cultural, which is our strong point. Yes. Uh, creates uh, this environment not only for people to come and invest and their sustainability comes together, but also uh, to open up, to be able to open up also new markets that they travel through the year and they want to discover different things in each country that they go. So Greece, the last three years, we have really uh, record-breaking num uh, figures. But you spread uh, them out over the course of the year. We spread them out. We achieved to have like April to November. Actually, last year, September, October, November were the best months ever. But also December, January, February, March, April of uh, 2017, we had double-digit mm. increase. And the reason was that we really uh, pushed 365 destination. And it's very important <laughs> because for us, it's crucial for our economy. Uh, uh, the tourism brings 20% of our GDP and figure. more than 1 yes. million jobs, direct and indirect, so it's crucial for our economy. Um, I want to bring in the chairman from Sharjah here, because this is something you're looking at now, because you've got these very ambitious plans to bring in millions of tourists going ahead, and that's a big challenge, isn't it, when you're laying out the plan. So how would you define over tourism? Thank you, Max. Uh, I think uh, Sharjah, <clears throat> just a brief background about Sharjah. Sharjah is the third largest emirate in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, we uh, do have a vision for uh, 2021 to attract 10 million visitors into Sharjah uh, by that time. Of course, that includes all the uh, mice sector and the, uh, the uh, hotel guest visitors uh, coming from other emirates as well. But what I'd like to say, Max, uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, maybe most of the audience here and our friends and colleagues are aware uh, is a very unique uh, destination as a whole, as a country. In terms of area, maybe we are not the biggest country in the world, but in terms of uh, diversity, in terms of what we have uh, mm. uh, uh, as an offering, as a product, uh, from Abu Dhabi to Dubai to Sharjah to Ajman, Ras Al Khaimah, Fujairah, and Umar Giwain, seven emirates, we each each destination has a uh, a USP, a different USP, and you can drive from Abu Dhabi to Fujairah, uh, which is like the two far ends, in two and a half hours. Of course, the infrastructure helps a lot. And what I think is very, very important also for, uh, for, for the United Arab Emirates and the, uh, what we have really succeeded in, uh, I would say if you look at it globally, is uh, planning ahead. So in terms of uh, over-tourism, we don't have this problem. But you're talking about bringing cruise ships in, right? So you're going to have huge amounts of people coming into a small country. How are you working with communities on that? I see, the, uh, yeah, that's the, again, it comes back to being prepared and, being, and thinking ahead, at least 20 years ahead. Now we are talking about thinking 100 years ahead. Well, you might can you give me an example of something you're, you're working on? To yes, as, as, a, as a country, for example, if we talk about infrastructure, airports, roads network, uh, uh, public transportation, uh, ports, uh, on the East Coast, Sharjah is the only emirate. Sharjah is the cultural hub of the Arab world uh, by the UNESCO in 1998. The book capital of the world in 2019 will be celebrating that as well. Uh, but looking at Sharjah, Sharjah is the only emirate that has ports on uh, both the West Coast, which is the Arabian Gulf, and the East Coast, which is the Oman Sea Indian Ocean. Now, on the East Coast is where we have cruise liners coming to Sharjah, and on the West Coast we have cruise liners coming to uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, and Fujairah. Um, now, of course, 
geographically, if we look at the, the United Arab Emirates, it's been a hub for trade for Nahor Port Horfakan, which is on the east coast of Sharjah, has been there for 500 years. So it's been yeah. there and it existed. But the, the facilities and infrastructure and the products that we create <coughs> around that is what makes a difference Mr. for our uh, you, cruise liners. Yeah, Mr. Dobri, if I could come to you. Um, in terms of the, you've been in the industry a very sort of long time, and you've obviously in the cruise industry. Um, which countries do you feel handle overcrowding the best? So if you bring a lot of people into a country, which countries give your customers the best experience, but also work best for the communities? Well, no, as a solution for overcrowding, the best is Ecuador with the Galapagos Islands. They have allotted a fixed number of visitors uh, that go there every year. It's a formula. Of course, it's a very selective formula from an economical point of view, because that brings up the cost. It's a formula. So then you have to divide between live cities and dead uh, destinations like uh, Petra or Barcelona. What the people of, the, of those cities don't like is thousands of people coming in every day, not leaving anything. And these people that come in, of course, it's a democratic issue because everybody has the right to go around and visit. But these people discourage the high spenders. So it's a process which puts out uh, uh, tourism which contributes economically. Uh, we've heard about uh, Venice. The problem of Venice is slightly different from how it was presented. The problem of Venice is a problem of perception of uh, danger to the city, the massive presence of ships. It's not so much of the cruisers. The cruisers leave money. My cruisers leave a lot of money because average spend is $700 per night per person. So we're welcome everywhere we go. But they all presumably home in on particular sites as well, which causes some consternation in the communities. No, I don't, uh, really, we can even tender. You know, when you have uh, 400 passenger ships, tendering is very easy. As you, if you think about it, we bring to cities people without needing to build additional hotels, additional cement around. The real formulas that allow to expand uh, people, that, uh, visitors that contribute money is myself and Airbnb. Airbnb puts the, um, the real estate at uh, income for the people of the city. So it's, it's a real contribution for the people of that city. I bring people that spend a lot of money when they go there. What doesn't bring money is the people that come in with their car, with their own sandwiches in the pocket, visit around and go away. And that, of course, creates a problem with the population. It creates a problem with other visitors who want to come. It overcrowds. So, you know, there are different solutions for different issues. We should come to Airbnb on that point then, because he's queued you up. Uh, but which countries do you feel do it well and get the communities involved and getting a stake in the tourism that's coming to those countries? Well, I think that's, that's really the point of... of uh, of this discussion is not just about over-tourism or under-tourism, but the right kind of tourism, the right kind of sustainable tourism. Um, when we think about sustainable tourism, we think about two things. We think about environmental sustainability, but crucially, we talk about economic sustainability and local sustainability. And as you've heard, uh, we are bringing new guests, new types of guests who are staying in different parts of cities. Somebody mentioned Amsterdam earlier. 69% of guests to Amsterdam using Airbnb last year stayed away from the city centre. More than 80% of the uh, homes booked in Prague last year on Airbnb were outside the main area of Prague. And when local guests stay locally, they spend locally. Um, our guests have generated about $6.5 billion worth of spending in local restaurants. Um, and what's crucial here is that local people are getting involved in hospitality. They're getting involved in tourism. They are seeing those benefits. Uh, tourism needs to be something that engages people and empowers people. It's not just something that happens to them. And I think as we look at many of the examples that we've talked about today, there are unique circumstances around each of them. And I think the policy solution needs to be different in each place. In Barcelona, for example, you have this combination of a very vibrant, uh, long-standing urban center with a, an incredibly popular tourist destination. And that presents some unique challenges that the city of Barcelona, the Catalonian government and companies like Airbnb are trying to work through and figure out how we develop 
um, solutions that empower local people, allow them to make some ex extra money, and spread tourism well outside the normal zones. Which is what Tokyo, Japan is looking at ahead of the Olympics, right? You've got this big challenge. You don't want everyone going to the cities. You want to get them out of the cities. So how are you involving communities there, and how are you, what's your plan? And uh, in Japan, uh, inbound tourism, we welcomed 24 million last year. That is uh, five times, uh, no, four times comparing five years ago. Then for that, some area, we have uh, over uh, uh, tourism situation. Then for that, we are planning to diversify the destination and also seasonality to adjustment. That is the two things we are now thinking about. But uh, for that, we are now thinking about three uh, initiatives to overcome this uh, over tourism. One is uh, we should rely on based on data. That means uh, proper data is uh, very, very important how to analyze and uh, which way to go. Yeah? Then, uh, for that, we are now preparing for collecting data and uh, analyzing data. Then the second thing is a uh, partnership, private and uh, public situation. Then I think the so-called governmental body, we should so-called diversify the destination then to uh, new destination to enjoy more so-called experience. At the so-called second the local level, I think that they should so-called analyze the data, the which kind of behavior of uh, this tour, tour, uh, travel doing based on technology. Because uh, there's a uh, so-called using big data, we can easily analyze which way are they going. But it's also transport as well, yeah, yeah. getting people out <laughs> yes, there. Yes. So you're planning for that. You're, yes. you're then uh, based on that, we're now CRC uh, analyze then, uh, which way to go to yeah. make more diversify and for seasonal adjustments, so such. And the final thing which now we are thinking about is uh, advocacy of importance of tourism. Because of over tourism, everybody okay. No more. Have you felt that in Japan that in people some area, are seeing some the dark area, side some of tourism? Area, some area, but not so across the board. Yeah, but some area mm. they, we have. Then and how uh, are you countering that? Yes. Then how, we, how are you countering that? Yes. And uh, for that, we are now advocacy of importance of tourism. That the so-called tourism bring a so-called lots of you see mm -hmm. economical effects and also people-to-people uh, -people exchange, then uh, to foster mutual understanding. Then for that, okay, then at the surface, at the beginning, some hustle. But in the long run, let's welcome. Yeah. Well, I should bring in the World Travel and Tourism Council because uh, uh, you're having to work with much smaller organizations increasingly, aren't you, if you're trying to work with these communities? Are you working with data and how are you convincing people that tourism is a good thing? It's a good thing, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. I think uh, from our perspective, perspective, I have three important points. The first one is what it was mentioned. We need to put it in context. For instance, Barcelona, just as an example. I went to Barcelona before tourism. There is a chapter before and after. I don't know if someone here had the chance, I'm sure many, to go to Barcelona. It was high crime rate, high unemployment. It was a pretty sad city, to tell you the truth, in the 80s. If you go to Barcelona right now, it's a booming city, it's very impressive. So there are some benefits from tourism that we need to make sure that we communicate with the locals so that they keep understanding that as well. Now, on top of that, I believe the partnership that was mentioned between the public private is crucial. On top of that, I think we need to involve the communities. There are some great examples out there, and that's why we want to be in WTTC part of the solution. Can you give me a good example of a project that you think has worked really well? Let, let me, for instance, something that we have done is we engage with McKinsey, and we are looking at those great examples, the best practices, and on December 13th, we're going to be launching that report that spells out exactly the good cases. One example, for instance, going back to the cruises, Miami. Miami is the largest home port in the world. However, you don't feel over tourism there. How have they done it? That's a good question. They have the right public policies. They have the good planning. They work very closely with the private sector, and they engage the community. And so you have all these cruises. I don't see a day during the week that they have more than five cruises. But however, they have cruises all week long. Now, the big ships, they go to Fort Lauderdale, for instance. They don't go 
the, to Miami. And on top of that, they have a good planning in terms of flows, in terms of real estate. Going to the point about Airbnb, for instance, Miami Beach, they tell you where you can use Airbnb and where you're not supposed to use Airbnb. So it's a very interesting case in, in that particular one because you see that tourism, if you look at Miami many years ago, they, they suffered. Now they leave from tourism, and that's a good model, for instance, that we should look at, and that's an destination very well developed. Well, the hotel groups face some of the challenges. Would you argue that the cruise industry has faced, bringing you know, large groups of people in one location? How have you worked through that at Intercontinental and getting those customers out to the right areas and spreading them around? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question and I would just applaud this, you know, this discussion because I think the, I would agree with the comments uh, earlier around, you know, growth is, is inevitable and it really is around how we manage it and make it sustainable. So at IHG we have 5,300 hotels in uh, 100 countries and territories so we see uh, a lot of some of these dynamics going on um, and I guess unlike you know, we've talked about uh, some of the sharing platforms and some of the, the you know, the, the dynamics coming from cruises. Obviously, with the branded hotel industry, it's a slightly different dynamic. You've obviously got the bricks and mortar, uh, you know, in the, in the local area. Um, but you also, I guess, off the back of that, do have an economic multiplier effect. And, and the local nature of hotels, uh, I think, is, is quite unique in the sense that the fortunes of a hotel are so intimately tied um, to the fortunes of that community. Are you talking uh, about the type of people you're employing or where your customers are spending? Everything. I mean, we've done studies around the economic impact in the past, and it's very much the, the three levels. You have the direct uh, impact in terms of employment. You obviously have the indirect uh, impact in terms of local suppliers, and particularly the branded hotel companies being mostly franchised, and everyone's moving, or most people are moving in that direction. You effectively have SMEs um, you know, affiliated with larger brands, so it is very locally tied. Uh, but the other thing that we've found is uh, it's actually the economic activity that comes into a community when a hotel is built and it's seven to one we estimate in terms of dollars spent in a hotel versus a local community impact for leisure travelers and when, it, when you talk about business it's more like 12 to one so although you have space being taken up by a building uh, you have this catalytic impact I think what's interesting is we think about yield management, destination management, seasonality, I think has been quite interested by that. Obviously, you know, the profit motive and, 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 you know, the private sector is very much around making sure that the demand curve is smoothed over the course of the year, uh, you know, and in given destinations. So What's the hardest thing about that? Well, I think the hardest thing is obviously you're, you're less in control of actually driving that demand. You know, you're, you're building hotels and our owners are building hotels where that demand is coming. Uh, and, you know, we're certainly working. And I think one thing that we've definitely seen uh, in terms of some of the public-private partnerships is how you can actually uh, partner locally, for example, with educational institutions or community organizations around upskilling and around developing hospitality skills, which we do through the IHG Academy, for example. We've got more than 2,000 programs running around the world. And that's a great example of you know, a win-win for the local community in terms of skills and obviously in terms of uh, hotels finding that great talent uh, to work there. So I think it's very much an integrated solution, of course. Uh, all challenges of sustainable mm. development do require those different parties involved. Does Carlson Residor also feel that they, you have a responsibility with overcrowding and dealing with it and spreading out customers across communities? Yeah, I would say that uh, for me, over-tourism over is the opposite of responsible tourism. And responsible tourism is something that we have a long heritage within our company. Uh, we've seen decades of growth, very dynamic growth, uh, combined with very successful and impactful sustainability initiatives that focus both on the environmental side and on creating jobs which have a multiplicator effect in the local communities. And one other thing I would like to say about large hotel companies like ourselves, uh, we are in 115 countries around the world, 1,100 hotels, is that very often the large international hotel brands do diversify in terms of destinations because very often we go into the locations as a first international hotel brand where um, no international hotel brand until there, uh, then has been. And that then creates uh, the, the demand for local jobs, we, um, for local suppliers. Uh, we have as hotel industry a program called the Youth 
Country's Career Initiative, through which we train underprivileged young people, unemployed young people in many destinations around the world um, to get hotel skills, but also personal skills. And 85% of those youngsters then go on to have a job with us as large hotel companies, or they get other jobs in the service industry. So I think that, div that diversification in the hotel industry of going and being the first in certain locations certainly helps uh, in, in achieving one of the aims that Mr. Rifai uh, explained. Earlier. But you obviously need help from the local authorities on that, local government, central government as well. Some governments are better than others, presumably. Um, you don't have to name names, but give us an example of a government which has helped you and how they helped you. Well, I think I'm not a, a policy person. I'm a sustainability person, so I, um, a little caveat there. But in terms of talking about locations that handle uh, the tourism inflow very well and in a very sustainable way, I was very impressed with what we have seen in Rwanda, where we have just opened a very large convention and five-star hotel with our Radisson Blue. And at the opening, I actually was there and personally visited the gorilla parks in the north and I think that is an excellent model of how tourism influx can be managed and people can be tourism, uh, you know, guests can be financially incentivized to also value the destination where they are going and the income of that is then used towards the nature parks, the wardens, training people and training people in the local communities. So I, th I would say that that is a, an excellent example of, of managing flow very well. I'm going to go to the minister sitting behind you actually from Georgia because we were speaking earlier and you've got this particular problem haven't you where you actually you've got too many people coming in it's too much of a rush um, we probably need a microphone to head your way and it is coming <laughs> if you put your hand up then we can see where the microphone needs to go um, we were taught that the Galapagos was given to us an example which worked well because they limited numbers, but you don't want to do that, do you? So what, what solutions are you looking at? Uh, yeah, we had a very interesting conversation with Max. Uh, the over-tourism, we have two different cases. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, cases when traditionally destinations when, where those have traditionally a lot of tourists, like Venice, Barcelona, etc. And uh, another case is Georgia, where we have... Uh, fantastic growth and in several years we doubled the number of tourists and uh, nowadays by the end of uh, um, by end of 2017 we'll have double of our population as a tourist it means that people are not used with this kind of increase and well, it's, the been a back, it's been a backlash hasn't there yeah and in our case we have a challenge as well to um, tell people what is uh, economic and different cultural effect out of this increase. So uh, we, uh, I think that we have two different cases like Venice. Uh, those uh, destinations have had and have uh, tourism in big numbers and those destinations that are doing very well but at the same time uh, this kind of psych psychological problems can occur. Thank you. Um, can I just, if I could come to the Minister for Morocco, um, when we talk about local communities and the impact on local communities, we're talking about measurement, aren't we? And this is the, the big challenge, right? So how do you measure impact on communities? We've talked a bit about jobs, we've talked a bit about cultural impact, but what have you done in Morocco on that? So I know you've been looking at it a bit. Merci, Monsieur Foster, mes chers amis. D'abord, un hommage à notre ami Dr. Rifaï. Et je suis malheureux d'avoir participé pour la première fois à ce forum, alors que M. Rifaï va partir à la fin de cette année. J'étais très heureux de vous connaître, M. Rifaï, de sentir votre humanisme à travers toutes vos interventions. Vos conseils sont très précieux pour notre pays et je tenais vraiment à vous remercier. Bon, le Maroc n'est pas, bien entendu, confronté à ce phénomène de rejet, de saturation que connaissent certaines destinations. Vous avez évoqué Venise, Barcelone. Nous ne connaissons pas ce genre de, de, de phénomène, bien que nous prenions en considération le fait qu'il faut prévenir ce genre de phénomène en diversifiant davantage nos destinations, 
en évitant les concentrations sur des destinations uniques, nous sommes en train d'essayer d'aller vers de nouvelles destinations, vers le sud du Maroc où nous avons un climat particulier, un ensoleillement pratiquement toute l'année, les zones de montagne où il y a aujourd'hui un besoin vital de développer le tourisme. Le tourisme est une question de vie ou de mort dans certaines régions de notre pays. Et il faut vraiment qu'on fasse, nous, gouvernement, les efforts nécessaires pour mettre en place les infrastructures qu'il faut, les routes qu'il faut, les connexions aériennes qu'il faut pour construire de nouvelles de destinations, pour pouvoir diversifier le flux de touristes que nous recevons au Maroc. Nous sommes aujourd'hui pratiquement à 11 millions de touristes. Nous avons une stratégie ambitieuse d'accueillir davantage de touristes et nous travaillons sur un développement plus territorial de, notre, de nos destinations. Thank you. I know um, Mexico obviously had lots of challenges um, recovering from the earthquake. It's been a very difficult time, but also lots of work done there in terms of measurement of impact on tourism, right? Yes, I think that I, uh, now that I listen to the Minister of Morocco, I feel identified because even though Mexico is already the eighth most visited country in the world with 35 million people, I think we are still under visited. Uh, we have 120 million people in Mexico. The tourism is 8.7 of GDP. Telling 10 million Mexicans work directly or indirectly from tourism. And tourism is so good that we have to uh, be able to receive more tourism all over the country. It is still very much concentrated in Mexico. Probably 80% of tourists, international tourists, arrived to five destinations. So our job is precisely probably the opposite to be able to develop more product, to build uh, more infrastructure so more states, more cities are capable of receiving tourists. Mexico is a country, that, because of its culture, of its history, of its gastronomy, it, it is every state is suitable to be a, a touristic product. So, for example, we have developed already for 15 years a program that is called Magical Towns. We're developing towns traditional towns that are capable of receiving more tourists. We invest in infrastructure, we invest in restaurants and hotels so they can receive people. Uh, recently, we also launched a program that is called Let's All Travel Through Mexico, Viajemos Todos por México, and the intention was to increase the level of occupation during the low season, because precisely in low season is when many people have to close some of the hotels or some of the restaurants, and so many of the employments are lost. And so we have precisely done the, a program to incentivate more Mexican traveling all through the year. And, it, and it's not based on subsidies, it's basically, subs, it's basically based in the private sector to produce uh, a packages of lower fares in the hotels, lower fares in, in, uh, in the airplanes, in the buses, to incentivate more travel, more, more, uh, more trips. So I believe that we should, we should work on more diversification to develop more product along all the country, more infrastructure. And also we have been uh, doing our best to work more closely between the Ministry of Tourism and the state and local authorities for urban planning. Because at the end of the day, what we have to have is sustainable tourism, uh, where the communities, as has been said here, feel uh, that they are improving because of tourism and not the opposite. And we also believe in the preservation of our, of our environment. So it's more diversification, more investment of infrastructure, more product development, and more urban planning, probably the way to go. We're far away from feeling overcrowded. Uh, we feel, as probably Taleb has uh, raised the issue, it is probably an exceptional cases in some places in developed countries. I think uh, the, the solution is quite the opposite, how to bring more tourism, how to develop more tourism all along the world and in our countries. Well, the UK does have some issues, doesn't it, with over-tourism in London, in parts of London, huge queues to get into the main sites. But, but that's a, that's a, there's a long history there, but you've come up with your own ways of dealing with that. Well, I think it's a nice problem to have. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd be positive about this subject, and I think it's something that we can manage. We have seen... 23 million tourists in the first seven months of this year is up 8%, and I'm excited about that. I think we've seen in the discussion a range of solutions. 
the solutions are about extending the season. They're about actually understanding through data the market opportunity and actually knowing where people might want to go that don't at the moment go. I've been around, I've been the minister for just five months and it's great to be here for the first time. It's a good example but, you've seen yes, in the first five months. I mean, I've seen uh, the way that our uh, tourism uh, authorities work together across the United Kingdom to understand the market opportunities. So if I go down to Devon and Cornwall, we love to have German and Dutch visitors there who like to walk in the rain sometimes. In the, we don't have 365 days of the sun. Um, and that's a great new opportunity outside of the season, in the autumn, in the winter months. But getting down to Devon and Cornwall is a challenge for well, Brits. <laughs> well, look, there are always challenges, but I think yeah. you know, our job as ministers is to overcome those challenges, to work with uh, targeted investment from national and local government to get the infrastructure right, to get regional airports able to serve those parts of the country that people don't go to at the moment. Um, and I would be positive about it. I don't make light of the challenges that exist in, in other places in, in the world that I don't know so much about. But um, I think we've got to look at this as an opportunity to be managed. I think if we collaborate, share best practice and understand the data well, we can find some solutions to this problem. What sort of solutions are you looking at for places like the, you know, the Tower of London, for example, which people are always going to want to go and see, and there's always going to be long queues? How are you going to deal with that? Because you're not going to be able to put people off going there or... Look, I grew, up in Bath. I grew up in the World Heritage City of Bath. I know about long queues. And I think local businesses are very... It's part of the culture, you're going well, to tell me. Well, it's part of the culture. And we have a wonderful... You know, I mean, it is about diversifying the options. In London, we have an amazing arts and cultural offer. And actually, sometimes people might want to try going to those as well as to go to some of our traditional um, venues. I think they'll probably want to do both before I get into trouble with um, the Tower of London. But, you know, I think that that's the option for us, to actually say, well, there's a big set of op options for tourists. We need to make them readily available through investment in technology, through understanding what their appetites are, and making sure that we, we offer that range of options. Um, in Costa Rica, um, it's, it's often held up as a great example of how tourism is sustainable there. Just give us some examples of how you're constantly working on that, and a specific example for the ministers around the table that they can work on. Okay, uh, probably going back to one of the last question or, or, or the one before, you were talking about how to measure uh, success in, in these in this issues. And um, I think that we, we found a way, because last year we became the, the, the the first country in the world to measure the social progress index, very well known in Europe and, 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 and used in many, many countries. Uh, but we measure that in touristic centers for the first time. We, uh, we adjust the, the, uh, the program, the process, the system uh, to be able to, to really measure what tourism is doing to the communities. How do you do that? How do you measure it? It's uh, 59 different uh, variables. Uh, none has to do with tourism. It has to do with, uh, I don't know, with uh, health, with education, with communications, with uh, um, uh, diversity, uh, uh, job. It's almost, almost everything. I mean, this, it's 59 different, different things. Like I said, none related to tourism. So you can really measure if the people in the touristic centers are living better, they have a, 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 a better social progress index than in the rest of, of, the, of the country. And we started with a pilot program last, last year. We have 32 touristic centers in Costa Rica defined already. So we did a, a pilot program in 10 communities. And now this, this year we're measuring the rest. And out of the 10, eight had a much better SPI than, than in the rest of the, of the province or, or, or the, the, the area. And in, in the surveys that we did to the households, 92% of them say that tourism is, is good for the community. Uh, it gets, it gets uh, uh, a better standard of living for the community and, and, and actually for them. So they really feel part of, of, the, of, the, of the tourist development that Costa Rica is, is, is having. How often do you... Ab absolutely. Uh, we, we are going to be measuring 
every two years. And, but one of the big advantages of this is not only that now we, we measure the result and, and we know something that we all say, but, but for the first time it was really measured. Uh, more than that is that, that you can defy, uh, define public policy. So local government and the private sector and the, uh, the, the central government and everybody can get involved and, 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 uh, and take action in very specific areas that can move the needle, as I said. You can, you can really change the condition of the people. And, and sometimes it's, it's something very small. I don't know. It might be a, a very uh, a remote community that what they need is, is better communication, internet or something like that. So with, with that, you can, you can change, you can affect the life of the people because they have health and education and whatever, but maybe communication wasn't that good. So by, by, by pinpointing exactly what to do in, in these communities, uh, you, can, you can improve the quality of life. And that's, that's the whole purpose of, 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 of this. And I mean, tourism is, is about that, is about improving the quality of life of our people. Well, Taleb, uh, we've had data mentioned so many times, not just at this event, previous events as well. This idea of me measurement is becoming more and more important, isn't it? Especially when you're talking about subjective things like social value. We have uh, two very important developments in that area. Last June in, the, in Manila in the Philippines, we launched after three, four years of work, what we call the indicators to measure sustainability. MST, it's called, measure, Measurement of Sustainable Tourism, which goes into the system of statistics now. It's a very, very important achievement, and it's going to be a UN-wide kind of, of, of system to be used. The second initiative that we did in this regard is we established, we have now 18 of them. One of them is in Greece, actually, the latest one. We have what we call Sustainable Tourism Observatories, which are close to what uh, our good friend from Japan has just talked about. <laughs> These observatories are there to measure the impact of people on visitors on a place. For example, I'm sure some of you must have uh, seen the movie Avatar. The movie Avatar was filmed in a park in the north of China. In that park, we established one of the first observatories. At that park, you have an observatory that produces a report every day that says the following, and I'm sure it's very concerned. It says, today there was 382 visitors. 21% of them were children under this age. They were consistent of this number from Russia, this number from Korea, this number from Japan, this number from whatever, whatever it is. And at the same day, we had 331 reptiles of this size. We have uh, this number of this, this number of that. At the end of the month, you have a report, and you could make an analysis. You could make, I mean, that's exactly the challenge that we have to, ch that we have to face. There is it management. Well, we have, we have 18 observatories all over the world, and we're getting a lot of requests now to do that. I think it's going to become more, more, more and more used. But I just want to add something, if you, if you don't mind, Max. Yes. You no. Know, as much as I am very much a believer in the right of people to travel and the right of people to be where they want to be, nobody has the right to tell me, I can't come here because it's too crowded or stop this, or put a limit on this. Yet we have to recognize that every destination, every site has a car bearing capacity, carrying capacity, of course. Of course it does. And there is also a limit after which your experience in a site becomes really very unpleasant experience. That's for sure. But what we're talking about here, that's not the case. The case in tourism phobia or over tourism is about people feeling bad about the people that are visiting them. It's not about the site complaining yet. Unfortunately, environment does not have a voice to shout and cannot demonstrate against us. They do that in different ways, of course. Are you concerned about bad feeling towards I am, towards very much so. And I, I, what I'm suggesting is the following. Bad feelings are really about people not feeling that they're getting a fair share of it. It's not just about the numbers. It's about what am I getting out of it. That's why what Manfredi said is absolutely crucial. What our friends from Airbnb are saying is very, very crucial. Now, Manfredi's example is a very good example. Now, his, his kind of cruise is a welcomed one because this kind of cruise are small, limited, high yield. They spend the night there. 
it's the kind of cruises that somebody sometimes resents are the number you dump three four thousand people at the same time at the same place and you tell them you have three hours go around they don't go in to eat a meal because they've already eaten on the ship they hardly spend anything sometimes if they're if they're kind and if they're if they're tempted enough they 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 buy a souvenir although the ships sometimes have their own souvenirs these are the kinds of things that you have to deal with mm. How can you make these three, four thousand welcomed by people other than saying, oh my God, now is coming another ship coming and dumping another people, another group of, of, of people. And there are many ways and we have been working with them on, on this. For example, if on the cruises you actually say you can eat the meal on board or you could eat it in one of the 20, 50, 30 restaurants in town and these are vouchers for that. You give a voucher, you go and, and eat there. The restaurant, of course, will pay a commission to the cruiser. So the cruiser is happy they're paying pay the commission. And they don't have to mm. cater for everybody. The, the restaurant is happy because they're getting customers. They, they see the visitor now from a cruise as a potential gain for them. And the customer is happy because he has a choice. You could do that for museums. You could do that for dispersing people. You could provide free transportation. The city should provide his transportation from where the ship docks to where they want them to go. They say, if you want to go outside of Venice, there's a bus that takes you for free. And the, I mean, instead of cities just bargaining and, and negotiating with, with ship owners on how much taxes they should pay more, that's what they should be negotiating with. should be thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, we should, we should be imaginative about this. I'm, I'm not suggesting anything particular. It's not a straitjacket. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is people should start thinking of how do we make the people of the city mm -hmm. feel that every customer, every tourist, every visitor is one of them. Now, I want to make a last comment because I, I believe that our good minister from the UK here said a very important thing. There's nothing wrong about standing in lines. You know what's, what's wonderful about London? London will never ever feel over tourism because when you come to london you become a londoner that's that's the, that's the key to it you enjoy standing in line i took me it <laughs> well, took me it took me two hours to come from from my hotel you just sort you. of go into them it's just no, no really, into them. really the point is you should lower the barriers you should lower the walls between visitors mm. and and uh, and the people and the power of london the power of london lies in the fact that when you come to London, you want to become like one of them. And that's, that's exactly what we want, what we want everybody to, to be able to do. Thank you. Q should be part of your marketing. <laughs> I want to bring in the uh, representative of the European Parliament here. Because, uh, have you got concerns about overcrowding, some of the issues that Talib was talking about there? What are the things that are worrying you right now? Thank you, Mr. Fester. I always learn a lot about Mr. Taleb Rifai, uh, like now. And uh, one, one or two months ago, I organized a big conference in the European Parliament called uh, the Mass Tourism. And immediately, immediately, I got a message from uh, Mr. Taleb Rifai and from the UNWTO. It's not Mass Tourism. We have to call it over tourism because not, it's not the same. So after this uh, message, uh, I started to use this one. And we have to think about it because for the European Union, for the European tourist family, for us, it will be one of the biggest challenge in the, uh, the next uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, we have to think about that, how can we manage it? We have to answer one important question. Do we need the tourism as one of the strongest pillars of the European economy? If yes, then we have, to, we have to support the tourism and we need better and cleverer destination management policy. We need better and cleverer promotion prom uh, policy here in the European Union and also in every European countries. Um, I travel a lot to China. Uh, I was one of the initiators of the EU-China Tourism Year. And several times when I try and start to speak about the European Union, about our countries, about our regions. And uh, when I ask them, have you ever been in Malta? Do you know Andalusia? Have you been ever in Budapest or in Bucharest? And the answer is no, we haven't heard about these cities or these regions. So 
if you would like to manage our problems, uh, first of all, we need better destination management policy. So in the European Parliament, uh, uh, together with uh, uh, other colleagues, uh, we started to push the European Commission and we started to involve the stakeholders, the tourist stakeholders, for example, the ETC, European Travel Commission, to think about that, how can we work together with the regions, with the next tour, for example, a uh, very important uh, stakeholder organization, uh, and how can we ask the national governments uh, to give uh, bigger uh, support to the tourist policy. Are the governments giving enough support? Um, there's area of opportunity. <laughs> say no. Yes, there are some great cases out there, but I think um, we also have a, an educational process to work with them. I think at the end of the day, as I say, we have some best practices to share. With EU, we're working very closely. I was part of that event. Uh, we were invited and we had a voice there. And we had a couple of things on the agenda. But yes, there, there are some opportunities still in some countries. Well, we should bring in some of the tourism ministers sitting around us as well at this point. I don't know if anyone's got any particular thoughts. If you put your hands up, we'll find your microphone. The Minister for Jamaica, yeah. just here, yeah. was speaking about this the other night. Yes. Thank you. So, thank you, Max. I, I'm excited by the discussions and the various strains of thought that have been guiding how we are examining this phenomenon of over-tourism. But perhaps we needed to look a little deeper on whether it is over-tourism that is driving the, the feeling or it is alienation or it is that the competitiveness that seemed to flow from the visitors' influx in communities, um, the extent to which visitors compete with locals for basic resources, the issue of real estate and the cost of real estate, the issue of availability of, of space and walkable and, and drivable and livable space within the communities. So the question therefore has to be how do we manage, how do we organize, how do we structure and how do we plan destinations in order to enable that coexistence of the locals and the visitors. And the second point, of course, is what Talib emphasized, the issue of the return. What does it mean? What is the retention level in recipient destinations with regards to tourism expenditure? Is there a net outflow of foreign exchange or is there a net retention? Most of the countries of the world today are experiencing somewhere in the region of 20% retention. And in some countries, particularly some of the smaller ones, in highly tourism-dependent regions, for example, like us in the Caribbean, it's up to, or down to perhaps 10, 5%. There has to be a discussion and a whole series of thinking and planning as how do we up that? How do we make the recipient communities benefit more from tourism expenditure? When that happens, there will be a greater feeling of, of, of coordination, there will be a greater sense of collaboration, and there's a deeper appreciation for the value of tourism. So I think finally the discussion must be, how do we lift that level of appreciation for this industry that is today regarded as the fastest growing and employing such a large swath of public uh, personalities. Thank you. Is, it, is there someone else? Uh, from, from Thailand. Uh, another point of view about to, tourism and about over tourism. Um, for our country, we used to receive big number of tourists coming from China. We used to face some misunderstanding. Uh, on both ways. It's a cultural maybe difference. 
and, but we passed that already. So what I would like to conclude is that it's not only just about the sharing of wealth, but another point is about understanding. That um, the horse, we need to, to understand the nature of the tourist. But then at the same time, the tourists sometimes need to be educated also. Actually, everyone would like to be a good tourist, and everyone would like to be a good horse. But from time to time, we tend not to understand every culture. But after some training, we get to understand each other. So I think I like the word what uh, Mr. Raifai has said. If tourists learn to respect, and I think they want to respect, but if we can help each other by training the tourists, and tourists nowadays, I think they, they would like to travel like a local. And if we can all help to educate and give information to our people going out to other countries that they should learn what they should do, what they should respect, what they should uh, be careful of when they're uh, visiting other places, then I think more understanding and more acceptance will be created. Thank you. Yes, good morning. I'm not a minister, but I represent the Spanish tourism industry. And as a matter of fact, a lot of comments have been made taking an example of Barcelona and no real direct comment from Barcelona has brought into the table. So if you allow me, I'll take the liberty of representing the view of the Spanish tourism industry to a matter which is very critical for us. As a matter of fact, the biggest challenge that the Spanish tourism industry has now on is how to cope with over-tourism. There have been very respectful views from the table, from the round table, from countries that have very different problems to ours. Ours, just to summarize and not take a long intervention, we follow very attentively service of what's going on in Barcelona, but not only in Barcelona, in the Balearic Islands, next doors in Madrid, in Seville, in Malaga, where the problem is growing and is spreading. And to summarize, it's not a problem of seasonality. It's not only a problem of over-congestion. It's a problem of civil contestation to certain aspects of tourism which are mismanaged and called and labeled in a very nice words, sharing economy, collaborative economy, which is screwing some of our destinations. And are screwing the way of living but who of you, certain who are you blaming environment. for that? Sorry? Who are you blaming? I'm blaming to the unmanaged growing tendency without laws, without the courage by governments to regulate something which is destroying, at least in my country, fifty percent of the contest and tourism of phobia in Barcelona is attributed to the sharing economy. Okay. Twenty percent to the cruises, the rest to over tourism. Judge by yourselves. Regulation is needed, strong commitment to avoid all the inconveniences of neighborhoods okay. which are losing their identities. Okay. And citizens protesting, not business community. Citizens protesting against that. Talib, do you want to speak to that? Yes, please. Yes. I have great respect for Jose Luis Sureda. He represents a very important private sector conglomerate in Spain. But I must say that this is not a very balanced point of view. And I'm sorry to disagree with you, Jose. This we, we stopped calling it sharing economy for good reasons. But regardless of what you call it, it has its good side and it has its downside. Would you define it for us? Sir? Of course. It's people renting, providing their services through digital platforms. That's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, it's not all sharing, I agree. 
because some of them are doing some business. I, I'll just give you a little, little, bear with me for a little story. Last December, I was in Paris, attending a meeting of hoteliers, and they were speaking exactly in the same spirit that Jose Luis Soreda is speaking with, very justifiably. They are up in arms against Airbnb and all the likes and saying they're destroying us, they're doing this, they're doing that. Because hoteliers want to stop this phenomena. You can't stop it, but you can't ignore it. You have to deal with it. I completely agree. You have to deal with it. Now, in the middle of all this, a lady stood up and said, why are you all against me? I'm a widow. I, rent, I inherited my home from, I don't know, from my husband and I'm renting it. And uh, why are you? So everybody felt so ashamed. Everybody felt so only to find out next day, one of the participants took it upon himself to try and find out who this lady is and what she's doing. He came back and said, this little Charlotte that made us all feel guilty yesterday is renting 56 apartments. Mm. <laughs> so that is a business. It's not a sharing. I agree. But the sharing part is something we have to protect because it's a good part. Now. I agree with Jose Luis, this is creating some kind of a resentment, especially in cities like Barcelona and other cities, where you have, for example, mm -hmm. somebody waking up in the morning and finding a different neighbor next to his apartment every day. That's not a very comforting feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, to feel that you're living in your own apartment like you're living in a hotel is not a good feeling. But the phenomena itself must not be the one targeted. We need to manage it, we need to control it, we need to put it under, and that's why, you know, Airbnb has applied to become member with us at UNWTO. And I found a lot of resentment from hoteliers about this. Then we said, no, we want them in. It, the only way to deal with the issues is to discuss them, is to talk about them. And they're cooperating with us now. So the, the, the point is, Max, that what you need to do is get it under control, manage it, you can't ignore it but you can't stop it. It's not going to stop. I'm going to come to the Minister for Greece in just a moment, but I'm a journalist, so I need to get a right reply from Airbnb. Have you got any thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I think, I think that is absolutely true. I think what I would say about the way that Spain has sought to regulate the collaborative economy, the sharing economy, the platform economy, whatever you want to call it, um, has focused almost entirely on the professional, the business end of the market. And that's perfectly understandable because that is really where Spain's heritage in tourism has been. The short-term rental industry in Spain has existed for decades. Um, what's new about Airbnb is the introduction of individuals, new people, sharing the homes that they live in on platforms like Airbnb. Um, a typical host in Europe is hosting for around 41 nights a year. Most of them are not businesses. The tension and pain point in most of the places where we are in direct discussion with governments is about where that tipping point is between individual activity and business activity. The rules for businesses have existed for a very long time. Um, the challenge specifically in Barcelona is the only legal route to hosting tourists in your home, sorry, anywhere in Barcelona, is as a professional. The business of sharing a spare bedroom in Barcelona is outlawed today. We are working to try and get that changed. If you're going to try and spread tourists out of the main areas, if you're going to try and let real people benefit from tourists and tourism and the spending of guests, you need to diversify the offering. And that's really where the problem has been in discussions with the Spanish government so far, is a degree of protectionism about their professional activity and a gradual acceptance that there needs to be some uh, uh, loosening and some new innovative approaches. And this is not impossible. Many, many places around the world have done this. We've concluded around 350 partnership deals with governments right around the globe to try and grow this kind of supply responsibly and in ways that involve citizens. I should just say that I think it's quite a one-dimensional view to say that it's residents versus tourists. Residents are part of the hospitality industry now. We have a very, very active community of Airbnb hosts in Barcelona who have organized themselves. They are now recognized by the city of Barcelona as a legitimate player in setting and deciding tourism policies in the, in the city. So I think we need to 
we need to consider residents not just as people that tourism is done to, but now as active participants in tourism who have views on many sides. And it's the job of governments and the private sector and citizens to get together and discuss that in, in, in constructive dialogue. I'm just going to ask if any of the hotel groups want to speak to this before I speak to a minister. Yes, I it has been said a couple of times that the hotel industry is against a platform like Airbnb or private uh, accommodation rentals. Um, I don't think that is true, but as large international hotel companies, we're very much part of the fabric of the communities. We are in it uh, sustainably for the long run and in a responsible way. Uh, the point which we, we are absolutely not against, let's call it the sharing economy, uh, because of course that is a good thing that benefits people, people's health, the environment, and that creates, yes, uh, additional income for people who let out of spare bedrooms occasionally and time bound. The difference is where the hotel industry and other uh, forms of uh, accommodation like B&Bs, etc., we are bound by uh, rules and regulations which benefit everybody, the guests and the local community as well. And I believe that whenever um, in a sharing economy there are businesses uh, that operate within those online platforms, that that is the space where there may have been issues that have ar arisen, and that is exactly the space where we'd like to see regulation and collaboration also to make sure that everybody plays by the same rule book and okay. plays We're on a level two, playing field. Two ministers on this. First of all, Greece and then the UK. Well, actually, I want to speak in general. I want to agree with um, the representative of uh, European Parliament because a few weeks ago I was uh, chaired in the OECD uh, high meeting uh, level and actually we spoke about three very important things. How uh, the governments they will put in their top of the political agenda tourism because for some countries it's very crucial the economy that depends from tourism and actually I will agree with Mr. Doc Dr. Uh, Talbrify that he says always that uh, tourism unite people and it's true because people have to be free uh, to travel and it's their own right because um, we, the second thing that we have to think about is that sustainability and um, the growth that it comes of inclusive growth as well is important for all um, the countries because uh, they spread the benefits all over the country and creates a lot of jobs and also is the bridge, I would say, that it's the driving force for other sec sectors to grow. Uh, for example, like trade, transportation, infrastructure, real estate, the growth of tourism brings uh, effort and, I think, uh, progress in the country. And the last thing I totally agree is that the public sector has to work very close with the private sector because what can I do as a Minister of Tourism, prolong the season or uh, develop new destinations if the private sector doesn't follow. Yeah. So these three things, are, I think, they're very crucial, and each country should handle this uh, management in a different way. It depends of their needs. And especially for Greece, definitely, we wanted to uh, have a sustainable and inclusive growth, and this is our goal. And we think that uh, we have uh, done a lot of progress, but the years to come, they will be even better. Um, coming to you, because you're a Interested in that debate that was happening, uh, looking ahead and how you're going to define your ministry, how are you going to bring those sides together? Well, I think we need to see the tourism industry and the opportunities it brings as a multi-dimensional, multi-layered one. And the traditional hotels will always be massively important, and particularly in this, in our, this capital city, uh, business tourism, business events, you know, hotels will always be a, a major provider. But I'm a little bit anxious about a narrative that says we've got to regulate this new economy, these new companies like Airbnb that are providing enormous opportunities for people that couldn't previously participate. And I think about my travels around the UK and the number of people that are using Airbnb, which means for me that some of the things we've been talking about is about the diversification of, of destinations. And so I think when we talk about regulations, we need to be very specific and we, we need to be very clear about what we're trying to achieve. Because I think if we get into a situation where we're talking about regulations to, 
to iron out problems that are really not as as well defined as as some say they are. I think we're in some difficulties. But they are, the they are, well, I think the point I would just like to yeah. finish on this is we're talking about different offers here. If you're going to a, a hotel, an established hotel, you're expecting a different experience than if you're staying in somebody's home. Are you expecting a more regulated experience from a hotel? Well, I think when you're in your home, you're living in a different way to when you're living in a hotel. So you wouldn't expect your home to be regulated in the same way as a hotel room. So we've got to overcome that difference and come up with some sensible solutions through dialogue and actually see both the old and, or the traditional and the new parts of the uh, hotel and Airbnb providers as, as collaborators uh, dealing with a, a new opportunity. And I think it's in that spirit we can tackle this in the okay. best way. I'm told the Minister for Uganda, I'm not quite sure where he is, has got something to say. Uh, you need a microphone. It's coming. We're keeping them fit. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. My name is Kamunta, Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities in the Republic of Uganda. I just want to thank the organizers and the resource persons for their excellent persons. The different dimensions I wanted to bring to the discussion is basically based on the principle of sustainable tourism for development. For us, sustainable or sustainability means benefit for the present and future generations. And for countries like Uganda, where tourism is based on natural assets, it's natural resource based, it is based on the fact that for instance, 54, more than 54% of the remaining mountain gorillas in the world are hosted in Uganda. To keep this as a natural resource, you have to do a lot of balancing. If you're going to have climbing lands preserved, or the source of the Nile, the longest river on the African continent, flowing north, very unique, and the lifeblood of Egyptian civilization or mountains of the moon with snow on the equator. These are nature based. These are attractions for tourism. And we recently had a, an international forum on conservation and tourism development. And it was very clear for countries like Uganda whose tourism is based on nature, natural resources the issue of climate change is something that needs to be addressed internationally because climate change changes the climate, it affects the environment of the wildlife, it introduces invasive species, and it becomes very, very uh, dangerous to the tourism development for countries like Uganda. So the discussion in this meeting, which is quite very interesting, is we invite you for an internet because these assets are really beyond national boundaries they are for humanity as such. And tourism is, 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 is basic. 10% of our economy and GDP is tourism. One in every 11 jobs is tourism. It is so central. But for us, tourism to be sustainably beneficial to us the issue of balancing conservation and tourism is critical. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you, uh, Minister for Costa Rica, you were talking about climate and how it's very hard to measure, right? But that's got to be part of the measurement now because people seem to be requiring it even though obviously there's a wider debate about climate change more broadly. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for, for Costa Rica and for many, for many countries where main product is nature, uh, we have to be very concerned about, about climate change. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things that we're, we're looking uh, at it. From uh, being, being a, a, a very small country, uh, it's, it's not so easy to, to talk about these uh, things. And the big countries, the, the big in, in industrial countries, have a big responsibility to, to us. And, and not only in, in, in America, but probably in, in the South Pacific 
the the situation is even is even uh, more dangerous for the for the future. So in 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 our case, although it's uh, over tourism overcrowding is is an issue, probably is more an issue climate change. Um, just coming to the European Parliament on the sort of regulation issue, have you got views on that? Uh, I think you know the European structure is very difficult. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we have to work on it, but uh, uh, I would like to tell you uh, it's not only about the tourism, but we need a new European structure, the European Union in the future. So if you would like to serve our people, if you would like to serve our voters, if you would like to serve our nations, we need a better structure in the European Union. And uh, in this new structure, we need uh, better influence of the tourism policy. But only one more thing. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots of political decision makers here. The private sector is another type of uh, the life. You have owners. It's very clear what they need and what they ask. We have owners, they are the voters. So if you are thinking about the over-tourism, we have to think about the uh, political uh, life. There are more and more populist political movements and politicians. Uh, and if they will use the over-tourism at home, in the cities, in the regions, then the tourism will, lost, will lose. So that's why it's important uh, in this room we have lots of political decision makers and we have uh, members of the big tourist family. That's why we have to uh, try to, 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 to give all these messages to the local people uh, and uh, not to give a chance to the populist okay. politicians who would like to, uh, to tell for, to the tourists they are enemies. So uh, that's why it's important to speak uh, about it. Tourism family, European Parliament family as well. Susan, <laughs> have you got a microphone? Hello, everybody. My name is Claudia Zapardel, and I'm chairing uh, Intergroup for European Tourist Development in the European Parliament. And um, I'm very happy because we have this discussion uh, here today. Um, I have another perspective, a more balanced one. Since the beginning of the activity, together with my colleagues from the European Parliament, and in this intergroup we are something like 150 MEPs from all the European countries, we discussed it about, not say overcrowded destination, but about the traditional destination of Europe. And of course, they are overcrowded. But in the same time, Europe is big and has a lot of other destination, a lot of treasures, the hidden gems of, um, of uh, Europe uh, is the way that I am calling uh, this destination. But these destinations are not promoted very well. And I think this is very important to promote the new destination that have a huge uh, touristic potential, a huge cultural potential, but they for this, it is a challenge not only for the communities, it is also a challenge for the private sector. Because I know it's difficult for the, let's say, the international hotelier chains to invest in a new destination which is not so attractive for tourists. But I assure you, I will give you the example of my country, of Romania. Of course, that Bucharest is very well known. But if you, get, uh, you, you don't know even it's heaven on the earth, you don't know about the, uh, Danube, uh, the Delta Danube, the Danube of Delta, which is an amazing place of, about the medieval castles of Transylvania. Of course, I gave only some examples from my country, but are so many yeah. regions and cities and... Um, places in Europe and also at international level in other uh, states uh, outside uh, Europe that are very attractive for tourists but we have to promote them and in this way we, we create a balance and just one more idea when we are attracting tourists in one country yes they are coming for three, uh, three days in Barcelona but let's the other three days to, to go in another city from, uh, from uh, Spain and other three days in another city. Let's create them. Let's diversify the products and the offer that we are, uh, we are giving to the tourists. And the last idea is we have to put tourism in the top priority policies at national and international level. Because if we don't put this, 
Yes, we can use in a very populistic way a kind of subject that we are discussing today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. There are so many comments we could get in. There are hands going up everywhere. Uh, Dr. Rifa, I know you've got to go soon. Um, could you up some your thoughts as a result of this? And maybe we'll be able to continue. I'm not sure how much time. I'm not got. sure that's fair because I've spoken more than anybody else here. But that's I really have one. a plane to catch. I have to be in New York tonight. I'm sorry about this. The only thing I want to comment on is just a minor comment the good minister from the UK just said. I even hesitate in using the word regulating. There are two very simple things to describe what we should do with this platform service economy. One is make the level field, the plain level field, fair. If it's a sharing economy, then the income must be taken as a personal income, must be added as a personal income. If it's a business, it should be treated like a business. That's the fair thing, otherwise hoteliers have every right to say what's going on. And that would require some kind of a register, some kind of a register, some kind of a tapping. The second thing is you need to have a minimum degree of supervision related to security, hygiene, whatever that may be called. Because there are so many things that can happen if we don't know about what's going on. But that's as much as I would go if that makes you feel a bit better, Minister. I know, I know where you're coming from, and I don't think we're coming from different directions. Having said this, I just want to thank everybody. I'm sorry I have to leave, but I would sincerely urge you to continue. This is a most wonderful discussion uh, that, that uh, you could have together. And I thank you all, and I'll miss you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Talib. It's going to rush off. Slip up. I see. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring in the minister from Madagascar. So I wanted to bring in one more minister, and I'm not there. You are with a microphone ready. Very organised. Yeah, you're on. Yes. Je voudrais faire en français. Tout d'abord, je voudrais remercier Monsieur Talabri Fay qui est en train de partir. Monsieur le secrétaire général parce qu'il a visité notre pays la semaine dernière et pour moi c'était un acte fort euh, envers la population malgache que je présente ici parce que je suis le ministre donc du tourisme de Madagascar et c'est aussi un acte qui euh, signifiait aux gouvernants et à la population et aux opérateurs que le tourisme c'est quelque chose qu'on doit considérer. 20 ans passés à Madagascar on ne parlait pas d'industrie touristique parce que ce n'était pas du tout dans l'éducation ni dans le comportement de tous. Quand je dis ça, je prends par exemple à l'aéroport, quand vous arrivez, le douanier, il ne comprend pas qu'est-ce que c'est qu'un touriste. Le policier, il ne sait pas, il n'a pas envie de l'accueillir comme il faut. Comme c'est une grande île, c'est une île qui est un peu fermée avant. Mais aujourd'hui, donc, c'est ouvert. On a 20% de croissance de tourisme depuis l'année dernière et j'espère que cette année, on va encore augmenter le nombre de touristes qui arrivent chez nous. Mais le plus important dans tout ça, c'est qu'on arrive à créer des activités. Donc moi, j'étais maire avant et euh, député aussi. Donc on a créé des activités, de nouvelles activités. Par exemple, quand les touristes de croisière arrivent, on a créé dans des endroits qui n'existaient pas la route, par exemple, des épices. Donc on demande à quelques agriculteurs de montrer les épices qui existent, comment ils font la plantation des épices, et puis à quelques exportateurs de montrer comment ils exportent les épices, comment ils exportent la vanille, comment ils exportent le poivre. Comment ils... Donc ça vous fait une diversité, diversification d'activités à créer, à mettre en tourisme, donc on a pu faire ça et ça a amélioré la perception des uns et des autres du, de l'industrie touristique. Ça crée de l'emploi, de nouveaux emplois, ça crée de la richesse. Et n'oubliez pas que, enfin on le sait tous, qu'un euh, touriste consomme, un touriste achète des produits, un touriste euh, mange, un touriste regarde aussi. Donc la population, très souvent dans des pays comme les nôtres, où on vient pour voir des lémuriens, on vient pour voir des baobabs. La population, parfois, est triste parce qu'elle se dit, mais on vient voir les animaux, mais nous, on ne nous considère pas. Donc, okay. euh, on a créé we're aussi... Gonna leave, we're going to have to leave it there. Oui. Only because...
Donc, on a créé aller. aussi donc, des activités qui font que les, 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 la population Thank montre les traditions et autres. Merci. Thank you very much. Dr. Rufai, c'est his last one. So he's... He's, uh, obviously, people are hovering around him. I'm going to let him go, but uh, I want to thank everyone for doing this. Obviously, we often talk about public-private partnerships, don't we, in any of these debates. Um, now we've got a debate within the private sector as well that's emerged here, which is good, and we've all kind of part of that community. And I, I think what I've taken from it as an outsider from the industry is this idea of getting, you know, if I can call it media, or getting the message out about different countries, and every country is coming up with their own way of dealing with this. But... As ever, it's about everyone working together. So this is a wonderful forum. Sadly, Dr. Revi's last. So I'm going to actually leave you with some words that Simon spoke to actually about Dr. Revi at the beginning of this. Uh, you moved the industry from being about what we can do for ourselves to what we can do for the world. And that discussion will, of course, continue. Thank you all.